There's really never been a period in which the Fed has had to fight inflation at these levels and been able to pull off a soft landing. On Wealth Track, Jason Trenert turned cautious early in 2022. What convinced him then? What is he saying now? Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. A major theme for WealthTrack in 2022 and 2023 is what a difference a year makes. You've heard it here before. We've gone from lower for longer inflation growth to stunning acceleration, historically lower for longer interest rates to rapidly increasing ones, history making monetary stimulus to rapid withdrawal, and liquidity-driven speculation in financial assets to risk aversion. With the exception of energy stocks, the market has taken a hit pretty much across the board. What further impact will these mega changes have on the economy and markets, and what will they mean for investors? Well, who better to call than a leading investment strategist with a big picture view? Jason Trenard is a financial thought leader, co-founder, chairman, CEO, and chief investment strategist of Strategus Research Partners, a leading provider of economic market and policy research. Strategus has been voted the top independent macro research firm by institutional investors for six years in a row. It traditionally provides asset management in separate accounts for institutions and high net worth individuals, but recently introduced two of its proprietary theme portfolios in ETFs. One is the Strategic Macro Thematic Opportunities ETF and the other the Strategus Global Policy Opportunities ETF. Now, Strategus is a WealthTrack sponsor, but Trenet has been tracking the winds of financial change for us since our launch in 2005, and we are delighted he is doing so again today. I asked Trenet to identify the biggest change that would have the greatest financial impact. The biggest change, uh, it, it pretty, I would say pretty obviously, is the fact that the Fed has gone from easing pretty aggressively to tightening, and I think maybe more specifically, maybe somewhat more more technically, they've gone from a period of quantitative easing in which they're increasing the size of their balance sheet, the assets on their balance sheet, to quantitative tightening where they're decreasing those, uh, those assets. And uh, that is a significant tightening of monetary conditions. And it, it, it's, uh, it, it has not yet had an impact on inflation, but it clearly has had an impact on the financial markets. And, and we're expecting the impact on, on inflation next year. To put this into perspective, Jason, I mean, how big a deal was the quantitative easing to begin with? I mean, it was a, of historic proportions. And therefore, you know, what's it going to mean for the reversal and the, and the very yeah. quick reversal? Just to give people context, the, the Fed's balance sheet was about $800 billion before Bear Stearns failed. It swelled to $4 trillion, so it went up by five times. And then during the pandemic, it went to $9 trillion. So it's up more than 10 times from where it was 13 years ago. And uh, for a good portion of that time, it largely just inflated financial assets. It didn't result in higher inflation. But once the pandemic really started to get resolved, uh, then you had a big increase in inflation for just everyday people. And inflation obviously is very regressive. It, it hurts uh, poor and working class people more. And I think there were real questions about quantitative easing before this about how regressive it was because it tended to increase uh, financial asset prices uh, more than it increased uh, your ability to get any sort of um, interest rate on your savings. But now you have kind of the worst of both worlds where you're not getting much on your savings and you have much higher inflation and, and in many cases negative real wages. The increase in your wages is less than the increase in inflation. Fed Chairman uh, Jerome Powell you know, recently said that he is going to moderate uh, the rate of increases in the federal funds rate. And, uh, you know, is that an, an acknowledgement that, uh, that perhaps they've done, you know, enough and that they are seeing signs of the economy slowing? The rate of inflation now has, has come down somewhat. So uh, does it look like uh, that their, their policies have worked? It's starting to work, and there are signs clearly that um, in housing and, and other parts of the economy where uh, inflation is starting to slow. 
Uh, having said that, I would caution against um, people thinking that the Fed is actually close to easing, because once they get to whatever rate they're going to get to, it's very likely they're going to stay there for quite some time. And they, they want uh, monetary policy to be somewhat restrictive for a length of time so that they can be sure that inflation is actually defeated. The great mistake in the 70s, and, and Jay Powell has talked a lot about this, is what he calls the stop and go monetary policy of the 70s, where the Fed thought it, it defeated inflation uh, three times, but it, it wound up coming back with a vengeance. Uh, so it, it rose to six, they defeated it, it came back, went to 12, they defeated it, and then it finally it peaked at about 15%. Um, and the Fed wants to avoid that mistake. They'd rather make the mistake of tightening too much and causing a recession next year. As a matter of fact, one of the reports that you have sent out to your clients recently was titled, Beware of the False Pivots. Why uh, should we be careful? I think you should be careful because inflation is now eight, uh, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to two. And so it's, it's one thing to accept what people call the, the Fed uh, put uh, accept the Fed to bail out the financial markets when inflation's low. That's easy to do for the Fed. It's much harder to do uh, to bail out Wall Street, if you will, if inflation is running at eight because uh, the average person doesn't necessarily care so much about their stock portfolio. They care about just making it from one day to the next. This is a very different economic environment that we've been in in really 40 years. I haven't seen anything like this since the late 70s and early 80s. So it's, it's a very different investment environment as well because of that. What is the impact that you're seeing on the economy now to this reversal of Fed policy? So it, the, the most immediate impact I would say is on, is on housing and other leveraged uh, purchases, so automobiles as well, where people tend to take out credit to buy those items. Clearly the cost is, is going up. Um, so you're seeing that happen. Uh, within the markets, I think you're also seeing, and, and, and also in the real economy, you're seeing a lot of, I would say, more speculative companies that have lived off the kindness of strangers in terms of access to capital. They're clearly having trouble uh, these days as well because the cost of capital is, is significantly higher. And so you started to see layoffs, let's say, in Silicon Valley, which that was really unheard of um, for right. many, many years. And now that's becoming somewhat more commonplace because, again, uh, money isn't free. And so that, that changes, really changes everything. But those are the two places that I think are, it's most, most obvious right now. So a lot of people are, are saying, you know, they cite that the low unemployment figures um, as evidence, in fact, that the job market is very strong and that the economy couldn't possibly be in a recession if unemployment is as low as it is. You know, what's your view of that. It cuts both ways, and I know this might sound counterintuitive, but I think the Fed looks at that perhaps a bit differently, which is to say that it's very hard for them to get control over inflation if you're close to full employment. And, and the Fed, of course, would never, and it doesn't want to put people out of work, it doesn't want to increase the unemployment rate, but it's very, very difficult to do one without the other. It's very difficult to get control of inflation uh, if the unemployment rate is as low as it is. So. The, if anything, I would argue that it, it, it probably provides the basis for the Fed to remain tighter longer uh, and to have the hangover from this be a little bit more severe uh, than, than might ordinarily be expected. Employment is a lagging indicator um, and profits tend to be a, a leading indicator. And that's, that's the thing I would watch most closely. And when companies start to lose money or, or their profitability tends to lag, that's when they start to lay people off. And again, you've, you've seen that uh, on Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, I have a feeling you're going to see that in more industries before this is all over. And Jason, what's your view of the recession versus soft landing debate? There's really never been a period in which the Fed has had to fight inflation at these levels and been able to pull off a soft landing. These are very blunt instruments that the Fed is using. They're not surgical. Uh, and once, once you start increasing rates at this rate, uh, it tends to have a bigger impact. The, the lags tend to be very long and variable, uh, and that's why there's a tendency to overdo it on both uh, the tightening side and on the easing side. Right, so, so do you think that that tendency to overdo it um, on the tightening side, are we seeing evidence of that now? 
I think you're starting to see, certainly, yeah. I would say in certain, certain parts of the stock market, certainly certain parts of the uh, financial markets, whether it's crypto or you're starting to see more marginal investments really start to disappear. Uh, and that, that's part of the plan. I, again, not, not specifically, but that, that, that helps uh, in the fight against uh, inflation. Uh, but um, again, it would be a neat trick, it, I, and I pray that it happens, but I, I, would, I would argue that historically, uh, the Fed has had a difficult time engineering a soft landing when inflation is this far away from its target. What are your high conviction calls for the U.S. economy? You're going to continue to have below trend growth. Um, you're, you're likely to have an increase, a, a pretty meaningful increase uh, in the unemployment rate. And um, I do think inflation is, is likely to come down because of uh, what the Fed has done. But the other high conviction idea is that uh, inflation may be a little bit stickier which means that the Fed will have to keep rates higher for longer than people think, uh, because it really does want to avoid the stagflation, uh, which is the worst of both worlds, where you get weak growth and high inflation. You saw that for a good part of the 70s. The good news is the Fed is very aware of those mistakes and is trying to avoid them. The, uh, the bad news is that it might be painful in 2023 for, for both investors and just people, uh, but by the same token, uh, it's better, in my opinion, for the longer term health of the economy that uh, the Fed and other central banks around the world get control uh, of the inflation that we're seeing now. You are saying that we're going to see below trend economic growth and, you know, higher inflation for longer, right? Isn't that stagflation? It is. It's how long it lasts, I think, is the, uh, is the and I think with, with what the Fed is doing, there's probably a higher likelihood that that stagflation is, is shorter term. Whereas in the 70s, you had to deal with that for a good portion of a decade. Jason, you turned cautious on the market and your Strategas team did uh, in early 2022. Why did you turn cautious then? And that, that was early uh, for yeah. a, a lot of Wall Street. We've had plenty of bad calls too. I mean, that, that happened to be a good call. Uh, but you know, we, a, a good portion of the last 10 years, we were uh, very focused on this idea of TINA where there is no alternative. Right, you coined and, that phrase, right, right. no and alternative so stocks. Mm -hmm. There are no alternative stocks in a period in which the Fed is suppressing interest rates. And then what was clear to us in the early part of the year was that the Fed could no longer afford that policy of suppressing interest rates. I guess you could say it's Tara now. There, there are real alternatives. Oh, right? that's and, great. And, I hadn't so you, heard Tara. You, you, okay. you can have, you, there are, opportunities for investors to get returns outside of the stock market. So a three-month treasury bill over 4% is very attractive compared to what we've all been accustomed to getting uh, for 13 or 14 years. Uh, that's one of the issues we saw earlier in the year, that the Fed was, going to, was taking the inflation threat quite seriously, and it was unlikely in our view that inflation was going to roll over quickly. What do you expect uh, in market performance for 2023, and what do you think is going to work? I'm still very bullish on energy. Uh, we're, we're also bullish on consumer staples and to uh, maybe a lesser extent, healthcare. Um, energy, in my opinion, uh, generally doesn't work well during a recession, but by the same token, I think there are special factors right now, particularly a focus on environmental policies as opposed to robust energy policies that are going to keep um, oil and natural gas prices higher. Um, I think consumer staples and healthcare are really just a way to hide uh, in a period in which it's going to be difficult to make money in, in more traditional uh, cyclical uh, sectors. Um, energy, though, in my opinion, is, is probably a very, is going to continue to be a good place to be. It's so interesting that you say that, and I know that you feel this way too. It's almost counterintuitive because the fossil fuels industry is under so much pressure, not just in this country, but globally. But you're saying it's, that's actually worked to their advantage. It's a great irony. I, I think the, the, uh, in the, Trump the Trump administration loved the energy industry, but it, in many ways it, it fed into the worst instincts of people that run energy companies, which was largely to just punch holes in the ground and use shareholder capital to do it. And now you have a combination of the ESG movement and the Biden administration, who's not particularly uh, friendly to the energy industry. And the energy companies are becoming much better investments because they're more focused on, on discipline with their capital and returning money to shareholders. To go back to the Tara, the, there are real alternatives to stocks. 
What are some of the other alternatives aside from the fact that yields have gone up, as you mentioned, and that so fixed income investments are more attractive, at least from an income perspective? I, I really do think the Treasury securities, uh, particularly on the shorter end, uh, let's say out to two years, you can get pretty attractive uh, yields, again, four, uh, in the 4% to 5% range, in a, in a, a period of time in which I, I think it's likely that inflation a year from now will be lower than 4 to 5%. So you can actually get a positive real yield, which is the first time you've been able to do that, really, in, in, 14, in 14 years. So that's, that's quite attractive. I also think there are some corporate bonds as well. Um, I would say high quality corporate bonds, you can get very, very attractive yields uh, there as well. Lastly, I, I'd say that there's, um, there are different kinds of stocks, what we call shorter duration stocks, companies that are very focused on returning money to shareholders, either through dividends or share repurchases, that are going to fare very well. Uh, and, and because they, they tend to be inflation hedges, you tend to get more of your money back more quickly and emphasize companies that are going to be around for the long term, that, that uh, take their, their responsibilities as fiduciaries very, very seriously and aren't trying to get rich quick. Another you know, interesting observation that you've made at Strategus, kind of on the macro level, is that you're calling the, the Fed now an ally of active management. What do you mean by that? Another irony is that actually it was uh, Fed policies were very good for the indices. All the companies largely got treated the same. There was no discrimination. Everyone got a trophy as far as the cost of capital, whether it was a strong company or a weak company. Now capital is going to be rationed and, and there'll be very different prices for companies uh, on debt and equity capital um, to use to grow their, their businesses. And so good stock pickers and, and good investors that can, can really determine which companies are stronger versus which ones are weaker are gonna have a decided advantage. This is the opposite of a rising tide lifting all boats. That This will be a period of time in which there'll be very different and divergent paths uh, to success. You have been saying that active management <laughs> will <laughs> I know for will too, provide way too long. superior performance for many years. I know. Um, and so do you think their day has finally arrived? Where <laughs> a kind way of putting it, I've been too early in thinking that, that active management uh, you know, you could say that's wrong and thinking that active management would make a comeback. I feel very strongly that the, the uh, significantly higher cost of capital is going to bring about that change where, where the paths of, of companies are going to diverge very, uh, very greatly based on their financial health. Uh, and their ability to get access to cheaper capital. So this will be a time, uh, I, I feel strongly, uh, with, the, with uh, interest rates higher, that active management should do better. One of the things that you've also been warning uh, clients about, in, in addition to the kind of the dangers uh, in the stock market, is the risks of financial crises or shocks. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about that and where we might see some financial crises emerge from? I think now we're starting to see as the Fed starts to tighten and money growth starts to slow, you're starting to see some of the air come out of the tire of these, of these speculative investments. Crypto, I think, is, is clearly is an obvious one uh, where um, I'm not saying that's over, but it's, it's, the game has clearly changed. Uh, there, I think there are a lot of also a lot of high flying tech stocks that were really merely trading as a multiple of sales, so did not have much in the way of cash flows or earnings. I, I think those companies are, are, are at risk. And I, I've been doing this long enough to know that um, the, the crisis is rarely where you expect it. And, and so you might have seen in late September there was a guilt crisis, uh, a UK, uh, British. Uh, British Treasury uh, crisis. And what you found is that there were a lot of pension funds in, in Britain that were speculating largely uh, with, uh, with their pension plans. And you didn't realize that until uh, interest rates went up very sharply and then a place, a part of the market that you thought was relatively safe became more dangerous than you realized. And that's one of the problems by, with keeping interest rates as low as, the, as central banks have is that uh, the leverage gets into almost every nook and cranny of the financial system, and and when it reverses, when the process reverses, you tend to find it in places you you didn't even know existed in the first place. Uh, but money always finds a way, uh, and and people are very creative, 
when it comes to leverage. And uh, if you give them the ability to use leverage, uh, they're, they're going to find very creative ways to, to profit from it. But it can be ugly on the other side when central banks start to take it away. What about U.S. Treasuries? The tab of do, covering our interest payments for the U.S. government is right. just going to be enormous. I mean, is that a possible area of high risk? It is. I, I think so. Yep. We have about thirty trillion dollars in debt outstanding. About forty-five percent of it matures in the next three years, and the weighted average cost of that debt to the U.S. government right now is one point six percent. Now. Um, that's a problem because three-month Treasury bills are 4.4 percent. So it, it's it's very obvious as the as the Treasury continues to refinance itself, it's going to have to pay higher and higher interest rates on that debt, and the deficit will likely increase dramatically just on interest expense alone. And so that's going to put pro more pressure on other parts uh, of the federal government. Um, and it, it's particularly acute because you have about 60 percent of the federal budget that's indexed to inflation. So Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. This is a little bit of a toxic brew for the federal government, or, and certainly their ability to spend uh, through both Republican and Democratic administrations, their ability to spend without consequence uh, over the past 14 years. Uh, that, in my opinion, is coming to an end because inflation is so high. What are you doing with your personal portfolio as, as we've under, you know, gone these really seismic shifts in the macro environment? What, what, what have you done? Any changes? In our business, you always ask people what they're doing with their own money uh, because it cuts through a lot of the nonsense that people can talk about. But I'm, I, I feel very strongly about energy stocks, so I'm very long energy stocks uh, because I believe there's a structural imbalance there. I'm long defense uh, companies. Uh, I feel strongly that, um, sadly, that uh, you're seeing an end of globalization. Um, and I also have a lot more cash than I normally do in shorter term treasuries. Uh, and, and that's, uh, again, because I'm, I'm nervous about the possibility of uh, the bear market continuing into next year. I, I don't really feel particularly comfortable being that as bearish as I am right now, but I, I'm just, I, I'm, I've kind of decided the discretion is the better part of valor right now. I'm willing to perhaps miss some upside uh, uh, in an effort to really avoid what could be a painful downside. So interesting. I've known you for a long time, and um, I don't think I've ever heard you um, as bearish um, or as cautious no. as you, you are today, ever. And, and you're a pretty optimistic guy, so. <laughs> I, think, I like to think so. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> and right. I, we have been, and so, but this is a change for us, being yeah. uh, as bearish as we are. Uh, one investment for long-term diversified portfolio, and the last time you were on, which was October of 2021, I mean, really, uh, you had some winners, and uh, your one in, you had a portfolio. Your one investment was Albemarle, which is the largest provider of lithium um, for electric vehicle batteries. And another one was um, XLE, which is the energy, uh, you know, select spider of the sector, energy sector. Then you had COMT, which is a commodity index. So um, congratulations. There weren't too many people on WealthTrack who had one investments that actually <laughs> went up and some of them spectacularly. What's your one investment now? One investment now, I would say, is Lockheed Martin, uh, symbol LMT. Obviously, it's a, a defense contractor. Uh, it's very much at the forefront um, of uh, aerospace and defense in the United States. And it's a big part of one of our themes for the next several years, which is deglobalization. And again, we take no pleasure in saying that, but unfortunately, the world seems to be getting more to be a more dangerous place. Uh, and Lockheed Martin is going to be providing uh, defense um, products, not just for the United States, but a lot of countries around the world. Unfortunately, defense is a, a growth industry, and, and Lockheed Martin is one of the, one of the better companies uh, in, the, uh, in the group. So we're going to leave it there, Jason. We're actually going to be talking to you again in part two of this interview about some of the major long-term themes uh, that you are talking to the clients about with Stratega. So we look forward to that conversation. So thanks very much for joining us today, Jason Trenner. Thank you. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is also a possible holiday gift. 
It is Read Manias, Panics, and Crashes, A History of Financial Crises by Robert Alber and Charles Kindleberger. First authored by Kindleberger when published in 1978, the book has been reissued many times since with updates and edits by noted economist and friend Robert Alber. This investment classic has never lost its relevance because financial crises occur with disturbing regularity. In a most entertaining fashion, it analyzes the universal elements of how the mismanagement of money and credit has contributed to financial crises over the centuries. Its eighth edition is due out in 2023. I look forward to reading the updates. Well, next week, we revisit the attractions of income with star portfolio manager Claire Hart of the J.P. Morgan Equity Income Fund. In this week's extra feature, Jason Trenard shares two of his favorite investment books with us. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Have a super weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.